I got the best dad. <laughs> oh, he's so in love with me. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Oh, gosh. It's silly. Wow, it's all by grace. It's crazy. Do you know that when we come into this thing and we think we have rights, you're in trouble? Because when you think you have rights, you'll say, well, I deserve this and I deserve that. and They deserve this and they shouldn't have done that and they deserve it. And I say, be careful because if you get what you deserve, we'll go to hell. <sighs> so let's not get that. Let's get what he gave us. Let's just walk in the grace that he's given us. and Let's just be free from us already. Wow, I've just been worshiping, just trembling, just loving God. And he's just amazing, and he thinks really highly about us, and he's not insecure, and he's really amazing, and he created us to be not insecure either, to be secure in him. He created us to be just like him. He made us in his image. Oh. I've been a Christian for a very short time. I've been a Christian for six and a half years. I was a drug addict and an atheist my whole life. And uh, I didn't believe in all this stuff. I thought it was more about rules and laws and just being right and being wrong. And most of the people that claimed to be right, I saw a lot of wrong in them. So I didn't want any of that. And people can't see Christ in you. They don't want what you have. You claim it all day long. You can try to witness to your family all day long because you want them to get saved. But if they can't see you being happy about what you say you believe, they really don't want what you have. It's not okay to say, Jesus loves you. Change your ways. Wow. You know, it's crazy because that word that you gave, God told me and spoke to me in the beginning of my life in Christianity six and a half years ago. He said, I'm going to raise you up to kick people out of the boat. Which is cool, and it's simple. It's not a hard thing. If it was technical, I couldn't get it because God blessed me with a big heart and a little brain. <laughs> so I'm in. Because it's not with your mind a man believes, it's with, one, with a heart one believes unto righteousness. It's, it's amazing. You know, you said about the blessing, about the storehouses and this and that. It's all in Deuteronomy 28. It's all about the blessings of God coming upon a people. But you couldn't have that blessing unless you attained righteousness. And Jesus attained it so that we could step into it. He attained something so we could step into it freely and paid for an inheritance. So I could just step into it and say it's all mine because of what he did. So now I don't have to do anything to attain it, to receive it. I just have to be and it's already mine. Changes everything. You can't be the head and not the tail unless you understand righteousness and understand your identity and who he says you really are. Because if I have to work to attain something, I'm adding to it with my flesh what's been freely attained by grace. But if I step in in grace, I can understand that I've been empowered because the very God of the universe chose that he could have had anything, but he chose me. He chose you. Now he set up camp inside of you to destroy hell around you. Every day. It's really good. That's a whole lot. We could just go on that one right there. Let's just go on that one. No, I, I love miracles. I love the prophetic. I love it. I love it. It's amazing. It's not just meant to keep inside the church. It's just not. Like, it's not okay to prophesy to each other all day long and then talk to somebody else that doesn't know Jesus or maybe knows about him but doesn't really know him. Maybe you can introduce them to a life where they could actually come to know him through you. Where you could be walking somewhere and all of a sudden God would just go... Whoosh, and flow through you and change their life and actually stop them from killing themselves. Literally. You know how many people I've talked to? and How many of you have seen some of the videos that I've done? Have you seen? Did you see the one in Las Vegas? That we're, we're out, I was with, uh, I was with uh, CBN and we're out doing a video shoot. And, and uh, we're in front of the Villaggio Hotel, which is, or it's like a water fountains there. I know none of you have seen it. No. It has water fountains like they have songs, music, and it's just amazing. I'm like, wow, these waterfalls. I'm a little kid, so I'm fascinated by little stuff. But we, we go up to these kids, and they're playing guitar on the street. They're just playing on the guitar, 
on the corner, and I was, nah, 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 nah. I walked up and I said, "Hey, man," I said, "Can I, can I sing with you guys?" He goes, "You want to sing?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "But you got a promise. Once I start singing, you can't stop playing." <laughs> so they're all, "Yeah, dude, come on, man. You really want to sing?" I said, "Yeah. Oh, this is great, man. It's just me and him, but yeah, let's do it." So I said, "Do you know any blues?" They're like, "Yeah, man. I can play the dan dan." I got Jesus in his own my side. And I started to let her rip, man. And these guys were like. Because I told him that when, he, when they can't stop once they start. We did it in South Lake at the at the we were down there at the some guy was playing guitar in the middle of South Lake, just jamming. And I said, man, I said, can I sing with you? And he's like, dude, really? I said, yeah. He's like, I said, but you gotta promise you can't stop playing once I start. What if we were really free from us? What if we were just free? What if we could just be free just everywhere we go? Say, well, that's not me. Well, it might be who you really are. So the guy at South Lake, we're right in the middle. You know where the uh, Brios is and all that? You know, Robert was with me. It was fun. And the guy's like, yeah, and he starts playing. And I let her rip, man. Urgh. People at Brio's were like, yay, clapping. It was all outside restaurant. It was awesome. The guy's like, looks around. People are on the, they're like, that was really good. And the guy's like, you got all kinds. And he packs his guitar and he leaves. <laughs> but it was too late because the kingdom invaded the atmosphere. Yeah. Come on, let's just be free. Oh. Yeah. Ready? Just gonna be free. It's really good, man. Come on, you. I was outside the kingdom. I was like a drug addict, and I was bold for the wrong God. And I destroyed lives my whole life. It's all I did was destroy. <laughs> Just in a nutshell, I was drug addicted and an atheist and hated Christians. And man, I just as soon pop one in the mouth because they told me why I was going to hell. All my life, you're going to hell, change his ways. My mama prayed for me so that I didn't go to hell. She didn't have a revelation of the understanding of, I'm not here just to go to hell. It's not a get out of hell free card. Jesus is not a get out of hell free card. That's just crazy. Sometimes we, when you hear the word evangelism, you think soul winning. I'm going out to win souls. I'm going to manipulate people and talk them into praying my prayer. And a lot of times it's evangelism by manipulation and intrusion. And we're moving from that to evangelism through an authentic invitation. Which is amazing. And grace comes on the scene. And people want what you have, not because... You're pointing out their fault and failure because it's not about what you can point out in someone's life. Anybody can do that. It takes a man of God to pull the gold out of what the world says is nothing. So what if we would rise up and actually believe that God's for us and not against us and He's for them, they just don't see who they are. But unless you're on the scene to point out who they really are, they might not ever see it. You might be the only Jesus that they meet on this earth. That's not blasphemy. You're supposed to walk just like Him. If you say that you abide in Him, we ought to walk just like Him. And if we walk just like Him, that means to look like Jesus. Jesus might have had dreads. John the Baptist definitely did. Come on. Locusts, honey, camel's hair, wilderness, long time. Didn't care about a comb, guaranteed. He would look matted up and... Repent! Oh, man. No, it was weird. Uh, years ago, God spoke to me when I first got born again. He said, I want you to grow dreads. <sighs> okay, my wife. You know, she, whoa. Now she's good. I asked her the other day, do you want me to cut them off? She goes, why? This is why. God said, I want you to grow them because I want you to break the stereotypical mindset off of the bride. That's awesome. Because God looks at the heart, and sometimes we look at a book and we judge it by its... I come into churches and I'm the speaker. 
sometime, you know, and I come in and I, I sit in the back a lot, you know, I just worship Jesus, man. I mean, I love sitting with pastors. It's awesome. But I love just, man, I'm just to worship Jesus and give him glory. And sometimes people are like, oh, man, that guy, you see that guy just came in, a new guy? Man, he needs Jesus. We're going to get him saved today. <laughs> and then I come up and speak and they're like, whoa. <laughs> come on. Tom, how are you gonna, how are you gonna be a good witness if we look at people wrong? You know, I, I started to try to get into it in first service, and I couldn't get there, but I tried to. And it says in, in 2 Corinthians five, it says, "Therefore we regard no one according to the flesh." See, Jesus, Jesus was given the ministry of reconciliation, not imputing the world's trespasses against them. Right? So he was given that ministry. And so now the same ministry has been given to us. That's the one that we walk in. Not imputing the world's trespasses against them. But reconciling them back to a loving father. Reconciling them back to a father that loves them. See, I, tell, I told people in the first service, Jesus didn't come into the world because we were such horrible sinners. So we teach the cross in that we were just a bucket of sin. You know, we were, and it's true that sin was an issue. But sonship was the real issue. See, why did, why did Jesus have to be beaten and bruised and broken beyond recognition? Why did he have to be unrecognizable hanging on a tree? And people say, well, because by his stripes we're healed. That's partially true. And I mean, that is true, but there's more truth. Why did he have to become unrecognizable? You know what God said? God said he had to become unrecognizable because we as sons have become, have become unrecognizable to what we were created to be. So he became that very thing so that we could become what he created us to be, and that's a son. That's powerful. So like he was beaten, unrecognizable, and he's hanging on a tree, and people said, well, you know, he could have called legions of angels, and they could have, and that's true. But he didn't come to call angels. He came to die. What held him there? Love. Love held him on the tree. He couldn't come down. He came for that reason. Love came into the world so that we could, re so that we could be restored to what we were created to be in the beginning. And, and through the cross and through what Jesus, is, Jesus did, righteousness was restored so that we don't have to walk the law and obey it to be a son. We start out being a son. We start out being a son. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, I don't have to walk all that out? No, I get to. I don't have to walk it out in order to be right. I get to because I am right. Whoa, it changes everything, man. And now, like, I get to walk a certain way because I am in a love relationship with my dad who is fascinated by me. He, he's amazed with you. He's intrigued by you. He says you're amazing. And we, well, no, I'm not. Well, yeah, you are. He created you in his image. He created you in the image of amazingness. Come on. See, redemption is way more than just being purchased. Redemption means that you've been brought back to the original image that God created you to be in the beginning because what the first Adam lost, the second Adam regained what was lost. He came into the world to restore what was lost. So now we're not looking like we, because Jesus had to hang that way. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become something. And when we enter into that place of being, we walk different. We act different. Our life is different. And all of a sudden, when this reality hits us and we start to realize who we really are, people are, lo are no longer our barometer of a good and bad day. Come on, man. Your job shouldn't be whether you have a good day or a bad day. Someone cutting you off shouldn't be a bad day. The measuring stick of the love of God isn't that everything went well. The measuring stick of the love of God is that an innocent man hung on a tree. One that knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that the whole law would be summed up and completely satisfied. The wrath of God 
satisfied so that you could enter into a certain place and never look back. Man, I've never had one day of condemnation since I've been born again. <laughs> I've never been condemned. You can't condemn me. You can't even reject me. How can you reject something that's accepted? How could your rejection stop the acceptance that comes from my father? If I'm accepted in the beloved, and I realize that I am, and I'm approaching you to talk to you about Jesus, and you reject what I'm coming to talk to you about, you didn't reject me because I love you and love never fails, and I didn't come to you for me. Come on, we have trouble approaching people because here's a lot of times we approach somebody and they... And we, we walk away. I tried that. didn't work. My gosh, they were mean. You try someone else. They bark at you a little bit. No, I don't believe that. Then you're like, oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden, been there, tried that, got the t-shirt, didn't work for me. It's not my gift. Since when is this a 30-day money-back guarantee, been there, tried that, got the t-shirt kind of gospel? I love you. I do. I don't love you so that you tell me you love me back. See, I've learned in the beginning of this thing, when I came into the kingdom, I've learned that this thing is not about me telling you I love you for you to hear me. For me to hear you tell me you love me back. Because if I did it for that reason, I only love you for what you can do for me and give to me. Do you think that God said I love you? Do you love me? Do you think that God is insecure when you don't tell him that you love him back? Listen. When God says I love you, he loves you before you... Before you loved him, he loved you. We know that, right? So God doesn't need you to say you love him back in order for him to feel secure about who he is. And he created you in his image so that we could know who we are. And you don't need to feel your security from someone telling you that they love you back. But you could be secure in the fact that you've just become love, not to receive, but to become. It's really awesome because if you approach somebody and you're doing it for you, you'll be shut down. You'll be rejected you'll, all day long. And all of a sudden you'll live and you'll say, and then you'll hear about the spirit of rejection thing and you'll think, that's me. That's mine. I got that. It's, does this make sense? Because some, Come on. Sometimes we approach somebody and it doesn't work out the way that we planned. Do you know when I was out there in Las Vegas and those guys we started playing guitar with and stuff and, and it was awesome and... I said to the guy, I said, man, do you have anything going on with you physically that gives you any trouble? He's like, oh, man, my thumb. It's his thumb, a little part on his body, but it hurts all the time. It's a skateboarding thing. He hurt himself. I said, man, give me your thumb. Oh, the kingdom belongs to such as these. <laughs> hey, guys. Oh. They don't get a junior Holy Ghost. <laughs> Help. This one go hug them all. Jesus. There's so many of you. I love you. Come on. There's more. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> You're just real. Come on. Oh, man. I love when you go out to Bethel and they put you in the prophetic thing. And they always have a kid on the team. And they'll prophesy and the kid will go, you know, I just see. <laughs> I just see. I, I see like this world and I see a flower above the world and I see a drip coming down from the flower and I see it covering the whole earth. And like you're like, oh. 
Because it's coming from a pure heart. It's just amazing. Not that we can't have hearts that are pure because my heart's pure. We can all be in that place. Wow. Okay. Focus. Jesus. So I'm out there in Las Vegas and I'm talking to these guys and and I and I prayed for his thumb. <laughs> and I said, check it. He goes, Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Just he's from they're from uh I think Finland, both of them. They were from and uh we're talking to him and I start to share, I see this depression thing on this guy, and I start to share about this suicidal thing on him, and I command this thing to leave, and I tell him who they really are, and he's like, the presence of God just touched him, and they're like, oh my gosh, what is this, man? What is this? It's Jesus, man. He loves you. Holy Ghost just went, boom, and pounced on you because he loves you. And they're like, oh my God. And I'm sitting there, and I talk to the other guy, and I said, man, there's an artist inside of you. And he said, yeah, you know, and he's, talking, he's thinking about going into architecture. He's going into that thing. Here, what you guys didn't see, if you watch that video, is both those guys were in Las Vegas. For two, they were there, they were there for another four days. Both of them, they both had a gun. Both of them broke up with their girlfriends. They were having a last hoorah before they shot themselves. <laughs> See, you don't know that, I do. And that's not on the video. I don't know. It would have been great. But like, what you see is God encountering people. What you don't understand is that everybody you walk by is wondering why they're here. You can be successful in business. You can, be, you can have this and that. You can have everything. And, you can, and that means nothing. You've got to know why you're here. You've got to know purpose. You've got to understand that God is completely and madly in love with you and these guys both like got like born again gave their life to jesus the kid talks in the video goes man it's just being real and he goes man look i said look around you man and up on the screens just all kinds of just las vegas man so it's crazy He goes, man i thought that god would speak to me in a church man he goes not here not here not here this is great this is god See, my Jesus, my Jesus, that's what he would do. Do you know that, you know, uh, you know they, they, some people have labeled me as Todd White Street Evangelist. And, and I'm a believer. I'm, 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 I don't mind the whole evangelism. I'm, I'm a believer. Evangelism as we've known it and as we've been taught is going out there to win souls. And I'm not saying that that's not the reality of it because it is about winning souls. But you can have a love for souls and not a love for people. And it's not okay. Because it's not about trying to evangelize to manipulate somebody into praying your prayer and believing your way so that you can prove that you're right and they're wrong. Because you can be very right, but be very wrong about going about being right. And going and talking to Muslims and talking to Buddhists and talking to Sikhs and talking to Hindus and stuff and the New Age people, you can't go in there and, and, and tell them that they're wrong and you're right or you shut it down. But what about allowing Holy Spirit in you and upon you to be a better evangelist than you? So I'm going to share some life stuff. I'm going to share some testimonies. And I want to provoke you to a place to where you can no longer be passive in any situation. See, because it's not just about like, see, the only reason why you see the videos that they're on the streets because you can't bring a camera legally into Walmart. You have to go through a chain and ask permission. We're going to go and bring God into your store. We want to film it. Is that all right? <laughs> Call management. Call manager, call the regional, call the, and they just don't allow it. So the reason why you see the videos is because, and it's not good to bring a camera secretly into a place that it's illegal and film God doing stuff and say, yeah, this is God. Illegally. <laughs> Doesn't go right, right? So it's not Todd White street evangelist. It's Todd White 24-7 kingdom lifestyle believer that believes enough for heaven to get into him and not just enough for him to get to heaven. 
Because you can believe enough just to get to heaven one day. And then all of a sudden you position yourself in a place of, Jesus, I need you to come back. I need you to get me out of here. The world's getting worse. And then your lens that you look through, Matthew 6.22 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And the way you see, the way you see becomes the parameters that set, that set everything in place. And the way you see, the lens that you look through is everything. And if you don't see things through a kingdom perspective and a righteousness perspective and a believer priesthood, not just a gifting, but a believer priesthood, that you're a royalty, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart, royalty and holiness. That's crazy. Dominion and righteousness, kingdom and righteousness, royalty and holiness. Why? Because when I say kingdom, you think authority. You think authority, kingdom, authority. Urgh, I got authority, but you can walk in authority, but not walk in character. And it's not okay to have either or. You can't just quench the spirit and not grieve the spirit, or grieve the spirit and not quench. You have to have them both. It's equally important. We can't walk without the power of God, or we or we quench the spirit. We can't walk without the character of Christ, or we grieve the spirit. So which is more important, not grieving or not quenching? Both are equally important, so we need a balance between the two. So, and I believe that that's what Jesus was talking about when he was talking to the disciples. And he wanted, he said, I have many things to share with you. But you couldn't bear up under it now. Why? Because kingdom and righteousness weren't available until after Jesus ascended and sat at the right hand. See, John the Baptist was excited because he was like doing his thing, man. People were getting baptized. But when Jesus rolls down to the river, he goes, <gasps> there he is. Jesus is like, I need you to baptize me. John says, dude. His whole life was set apart for the very purpose of this. And now this is here. Jesus comes down. John's like, I need you to baptize me. Jesus couldn't baptize John. Because the baptism that Jesus was going to give was going to be after Jesus went and sat at the right hand and Holy Ghost and fire came. That's what John's saying. I need it. What you got, I need. She said, no, let it be so. For it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So the whole law that Jesus came, walked out as a man, did everything as a man. He didn't do it as God. He did it as a man in full relationship with God, filled with God. I know you guys are already on page, so I don't have to go into that because I know just from being here that that's, that's foundational. But when Jesus went down to that river, the heavens opened when he came back out and they never closed again. Because heaven was legally opened. Because righteousness had been fulfilled. In Deuteronomy 28, it talks about, I will open the heavens and rain. In Deuteronomy 28, it says, I'll be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. And Deuteronomy 28 was only available if somebody attained righteousness, and they had to do it through works. So Jesus attained that. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He had fulfilled all righteousness. Heavens were open. God became daddy instead of Jehovah this and Jehovah that. He became Jehovah daddy. This is my son, whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was told he's the son. He goes out into the wilderness. He's, he's fasting. He's hungry. The devil comes up and says, I know you're hungry. If you're son, then do something to prove it. Jesus is like, I don't have to do anything to prove it. God just told me before I came out here that I'm a son. It's really that simple. Honestly, I know that you could look back and it's scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the father. Well, God just said, you're my son. Jesus believed it. See, Satan's always trying to get you to question your identity as a son. That's what he's after. He was after it in Adam. He said to Eve, he said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. That's the only reason God doesn't want you to eat, because if you eat it, you'll be like him. Well, Eve, you're already like him. But I'm going to eat it because I really don't know that I am. So now Satan is trying to dangle the same thing in front of you to try to get you to do something to prove that you're a son instead of just acting in a place of being instead of trying to work things out performance-wise to earn something that's already yours. But if we realize that it's already ours and our identity gets solid in that, all of a sudden our life becomes different. Our walk becomes different. Our job becomes different. Our schools become different. 
our teachers get rocked because we have the love of God and they don't have a choice? Let me ask you something. Now, I've got lots of relatives and stuff that, man, I destroyed people's lives, dude. And, like, when I came into this thing, it, it totally aggravated and angered people even more. If God says, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you'll have it if you don't doubt. Is it God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of him? Okay, so we got that one working for us. What if I have a relative that's in rebellion and doesn't believe? Is it possible that the reason why they don't believe is because our war is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places? And the reason why they don't believe is because their thought life, their belief system has been dominated by demonic strongholds? Is it possible that our war is really not against them? How then is it possible... For someone's free will that's blinded by principalities, dominated by lies, and listening to the voice of a stranger, how then is their free will dominant above a free will of a believer that believes and is in co-laboring, co-union, and one with God? Is it possible that maybe we just haven't believed? I believe it's impossible for any of my relatives to get out of this. See, we've been taught free will and we've been captivated into free will teaching not realizing that their free will is blinded by lies. So since when did someone's free will that's blinded and possessed by lies dominate someone, a believer whose free will is possessed by truth? So what if we could look at someone and say, hey, you're going to be on my team. I know you already are, but what if, what if we had a relative or somebody in our life that just was angry and bitter and didn't believe? And what if we just looked at him and said, you're on my team? He said, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are, because I believe for you. Come on. Don't allow your teaching to excel what the Bible says. That there's a good word. Really is. Because I've watched one by one of my relatives come in. They can't get out of this for real. My mom that prayed for me to not go to hell. When I came into the kingdom. And I actually. Because like I'm with this girl for nine years. I destroyed her life. She's my girlfriend. I have a seven and a half year old daughter. All my daughter knew was her dad's a liar. He can't hold a job. He steals from everybody. And he's just. That's all he knows how to do. So. I go and I asked Jesus to possess my life one day when I was suicidal. I went and I met somebody that reminded me of who Jesus would have been. I didn't even know who Jesus was. I was wooed. I was an atheist. I did not, was not searching for God. He was searching for me. God's pursuing me. He's pursuing all these people that you want to talk into the kingdom. They're, he's pursuing them already. He got that working for you. He wants them all. So I go in there and I, I pray this prayer, I, Jesus, come and dominate my life. I give you my life. So I, I feel good and I have an emotional response. I never open the word to renew my mind so I can change the way I think. So then all of a sudden, drug addiction got worse. So for five and a half months, drug addiction got more intense. Now I'm doing more drugs than I did before. And I have become the very hypocrite going to church on Sunday, living like hell all the way through the week. And my girlfriend is very angry and bitter, and you're a holy rolling hypocrite. So I became that very thing, subtly. It was crazy. I didn't even see it coming. So I go five and a half months later, and I go out in a crack deal one night, and I pick up this kid. He's from New York City. Pick him up and ask him what kind of drugs, you know, what he had. And he gives me the drugs. I have in my hand a big lump. And I said to him, I said, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And I read him his rights. And the kid's like, I knew you were a cop. I knew it. And I'm thinking, man, I got this guy. Serious. Because he's believing the lie. So I said, step out of the car and put your hands on the hood. And when he did, I hit the gas and he unloaded a 9 millimeter at me from 10 feet away. 10 feet. If I shot at you with a 9 millimeter from 10 feet, I guarantee you, I'd hit you. 
Not one bullet hit my vehicle. Not one bullet hit me. And the voice of God spoke to me and said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? See, I was there. He, he like, see, I should be dead. And I am. See, I tell people the gospel sets you free from you. That's the honest, that's the whole purpose of the gospel. It sets you free. See, it's not deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It's deny yourself. So the gospel sets you free from you. See, if the gospel sets you free from you, then you'll be free from others. And if you're free from others, that just means that you will never put an expectation on somebody else that if they don't meet it, that they don't meet your criteria and you can't love them because they didn't perform to the level that you agreed to in your mind for them to be at in order for you to accept them. And we can't love people because the only reason we're really loving them is for us. We love people. Look, let me take it a little deeper. Sometimes we have wives that are praying for husbands and husbands that are praying for wives so that they get saved so that the husband, we're praying for our wife so that our wife, so that our, and a lot of times I find it more in wives than husbands where the wife is praying for the husband so that he gets saved so that their life gets better. And it's selfish because we're praying for them, for us. Shift your prayer and pray for them so that they have relationship and learn who their dad is. So that they know who they really are. Okay. That's a good, man, take that one in, honest. Change that. Don't pray for your son so that your life gets better. Don't pray for your daughter so that your life gets better. Lift your daughter up before God so that she knows who she really is. So she understands that she has an amazing father and it's not you. I mean, you can be an amazing father, but God's way more amazing. Call no one on earth your father, for you have one father. All right, just a little bit of identity stuff. Just, I'm all about that, man. It's awesome. Okay. All right, so the other day... Um, yeah, well, I better finish that, the testimony real quick. So, girlfriend hates me. I get shot at that night. F three days later, I'm in Teen Challenge. My daughter is sad because dad's leaving. I'm her, she's my daughter. She's upset. Dad can't do anything right, but I'm still her dad. She loves me, so she's hurt. So I have to go to Teen Challenge for a year. Have to have to go in there agreeing to coming in there for a year. I go in there three days later. I can't see my girlfriend. She hates me anyway. She doesn't want anything to do with me. I destroyed her life. I had 30 jobs. I quit or got fired from every one. I mean, I stole all. That's all I knew how to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. See, we were cultivated by the very enemy of God. So a lot of death, loss, and destruction is in the way that we think. Even though we might not see it, it's there. So we need to have our minds renewed so we can think like God. Start to re-look at things, re-look at things from heaven's perspective to see things through his eyes. So I go to Teen Challenge. I'm in there for two months. I have a radical encounter with Jesus two months into it, three nights in a row. I meet this homeless guy one day, and he prays for me and disappears. I, it's nuts. That Sid Roth did a reenactment of the testimony. He did a pretty good job. And he did it, except for when the guy shot at me. I was 10 feet away. He wasn't further away. Anyway, this guy prays for me. I have these three dreams, these three nights in a row where I encounter Jesus. And the third night, he tells me to go home. So I'm two months into a, a year program. So he says go home. So I wake up in the morning. I pack my stuff. I'm out. I'm ready to go. I go downstairs and tell the counselors, hey, man. I met God, Jesus, last night, and he told me to go home. They're like, Ugh. didn't go over well. And in most cases, it's not good to leave a program like that early, and it better be God. But I've always learned and understood that the fruit upon your tree will bear witness of what kind of tree you are. So Dan came up, my spiritual dad came up and picked me up. He brings me home. I come home, come to find out my girlfriend had come to Christ when I was in there. Pretty awesome. And I knew in my heart that I could no longer live there. So we got married four days later. See, I destroyed her life and she never read the Bible.
Never read the Bible, but she got, she came to Jesus when I was in there. Like God wooed her heart and bring her in. So we both knew that I couldn't live there anymore. And my daughter and, you know, the whole nine yards. So we get married four days later. So at my wedding, four days later, and this is like path of destruction for nine years, 22 years of drug addiction. My girlfriend knows in her heart already that I'm a brand new man. So we invite her parents and everybody to come to service. Come to, because we didn't plan a wedding and have this big wedding. We, we did it right in the middle of two church services. The first one's letting out, the second one's coming in, and we did it right in the middle. Because it's not about your big wedding, it's about a covenant between you and God. Why would you go in debt $20,000 and it's about your covenant? Okay, I won't touch that one. It's, if you want a big wedding, that's awesome. But make sure it's about covenant. That's cool. I'm not saying you shouldn't have one. Because if you can do it, do it. But her family comes, and they're very angry and not wanting to be there. And her mom is in tears, and she's just totally upset. That her, why, is, why are you doing this? Why are you? Look what he's done. My daughter's like, this is my new dad. See, that's way, it's way more powerful than you know. See, my daughter has absolutely zero memory of drug addiction her whole life. It actually is completely, God crushed it. Like if you ask her, she'll tell you, I have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. She didn't just block it out. It's actually removed. See, I preach righteousness. I preach redemption. I preach a brand new creation reality. To where God makes old things pass away. To where literally all things become new. It's really finished. It's not to be continued. It's really done. And so my daughter has a my daughter has a grasp on righteousness, a grasp on redemption. See, redemption just mean doesn't mean that I've been purchased. Redemption means that, but it also means that I've been brought back to the original value as if I've never eaten the tree. So when we start to see ourselves like that, we walk different. What if you had no past in your life? What if the voices that you're hearing aren't voices inside that need to get out, but voices outside trying to come back in to reclaim your identity again? There's a stranger's voice, and he wants to whisper and get you to bite something. He wants to get you to bite the bait so that you turn and rebuke him and command him to get behind you, but the Bible already says that he is behind you, so why would I make him get behind me when he already is? As a matter of fact, the highest part of hell is beneath the lowest part of you. So at my wedding, her mom's there, and I start to like, just tell her, thank you for coming, thank you so much, and she's crying, she goes, I, I can't believe this. She's sad, her stepdad's there, and I said to him, I said, man, I said, thanks for coming, man, he goes, you're a loser and you'll always be one, you don't fool me. That's what he said. You know what I did? I said, man, you'll see, I love you. You know what he said? Get the blank away from me, you loser. <laughs> you know, from the beginning of my life, I never allowed people's sin against me to produce sin in me. I'm really free. This thing never shuts down. It's really like this all the time. I'm on high or on off. I'm sleeping or I'm on high. That's just the way it is. It's really good news. God's really pleased and I'm just agreeing with him. He's really happy. He's not mad. And he really wants us to get it and realize that we don't have to be mad either. Yay. So we, so we start our life together. And I, I want to share you, with you how this thing got birthed in my life. Because that's going to bear immediate fruit in your life. And I'll only share with you what has been accomplished in me. Nothing will I share that hasn't been accomplished me, with me in action because that won't change your life. It'll tickle your ears, but it won't change your life. And I'm not here to tickle your ears to give you another good message. I'm here to provoke you with a godlike jealousy that you can no longer remain the same. It's where you have to step out. And sooner or later, the tipping point comes where you have to step out because you can hold it in any longer. You're going to burst if you do. And boom, it'll be a mess. Yeah. So in the beginning of my life, my girlfriend becomes my wife, and we're starting our new life together. So I go out there, and I start my, my, my new job. 
And like, I never held a job before. But now I realize that Colossians 3.17, 3.23 says, whatever I do, I'm going to do it unto the Lord. I'm not going to do it for man. I'm going to do it unto the Lord. So I'm like so psyched and so happy. And I'm like, yay, this is awesome. So I go to my job. I get, I get a pipeline job. And I, I told my wife, I said, this is going to be awesome. And she's like, you are really excited. Something's really different about you. I said, yeah, I'm going to work for Jesus. It's going to be awesome. And it's not so much working for him, it's co-laboring with him. Because he wants to help me do my job amazing, because we can be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But God is shifting and changing that, so that we can be so heavenly minded that we're earthly amazing. And all of a sudden our jobs are like crazy, and they want more people just like you. And if they could reproduce you a hundred times over, they would. And if we'd hold fast to the very fact that people that's free will is dominated by principalities... They can't trump a free will of a believer's free will that's dominated by truth and possessed by the truth. And sooner or later, what's in you and what's upon you gets on the people around you to where your whole workplace becomes a Christian atmosphere. You don't know where I work. I hear that all the time. You don't know what kind of job I got. So what? Man, come on. Either God's greater or he's not. Sometimes we got a basket on our head. It's the word of God. It says it. It says you're a city on a hill. No one takes a bushel and puts it on his head. No one hides this thing under a bed. Do you know that when you're possessed by truth and actually the God of the universe fills you and possesses you and it's all through the love of God when you realize that he's for you and he loves you, your workplace is transformed because you're there. Not because it's dark. People are like, man, my job is dark, man. It's just darkness, Jesus. I need, gosh. You start to read the Bible through a lens of the rapture mentality where God's going to need to get me out of here. I'm praying for Jesus' return. And what we do is we, we, we position ourselves and we start to look through that lens and we read the Bible through a certain lens. And oh my gosh, the signs of the times. Look at this. It's getting worse. People are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, not lovers of God. And oh my gosh, it's getting worse. Jesus, get me out of here. To heaven with me and to hell with the world. That's not okay. The way that I'm talking to you about is way more fun. Really is. You guys okay? I don't know how much time we have, but I'm okay. Yeah, you guys just, hey man, just cut me off. Because I'm just going to go. We're just going to roll with it. All right? Okay. So I, so I go to job, my first day on the job, and I, I go there, and they, they, I have a hard hat, and they give me my gear, and I'm going to be a pipe layer. I never laid pipe before, but I'm going to do an amazing job because Jesus is going to help me. It's going to be awesome. And this is just, I'm like, yeah, I'm excited. So I go in there, and I, I watch this guy walk by me, and he's got this hard hat. And he's got all this stuff written on it. And it wasn't so nice as stuff. And I got a magic marker and my hard hat, and the lady gives it to me, and I look at this guy, and I go, you're allowed to write on your hard hat? She goes, yeah, just don't swear. I go, oh, I won't swear. So I, like, possess my helmet of salvation. <laughs> Serious. First day on the job, man. And I'm working. Anybody ever laid pipe before? Okay. Those guys aren't always on page with Jesus. Construction. You know, they're just not, like, it's just a different industry. And so... I go on my job, I get there, I go in the job truck my first day, and I'm like, I'm so excited, and I'm like, man, this is awesome, it's like, it's like 5.30 in the morning, you know, I'm I'm in the truck, I get in there, there's two guys beside me, two guys up front, and I said, hey man, how you guys doing? Dude, they're tired, you know, they coffee, gotta have coffee to survive, and I'm not saying anything about your coffee, it's blessed you, I just don't drink it. Thank God. <laughs> ah! no. Okay, so I'm just really excited, and I'm like, man, you guys, I just want to tell you guys, you're all so amazing. God loves you so much. And the one guy in the front says, shut the blank up, and cranks the music way up, you know. And I'm like, okay. I'm serious, dude. This is really how it went. My first day on the job, my first day of work. I'm excited, because I'm going to bring Jesus. I'm going to save the whole workplace. It's awesome. But I know that I can't do it by the words that I speak. 
So I go there and I meet my foreman the first day. And I'm excited, man. I go, man, I'm going to do an amazing job. He goes, oh, wow, who'd you work for before? I said, man, I didn't work for anybody before. Man, I had 30 jobs. I quit or got fired from every one. But I'm not working for you. I'm working for Jesus. He's an atheist. <laughs> Serious. He's like, man, shut your blanking pie hole. <laughs> and he just let me have it. <laughs> wham, wham. Let me have it. And he said, get in the trench. They'll show you what to do. So I'm in the trench and... I love my job. I love my peeps. I'm like, man, you're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. All day long, I told my boss that I was going to do an amazing job. In three months, we're the number two pipe crew in the whole company. And the only pipe crew that's ahead of us is a team that's been together solid for seven years, everybody the same, doing the same job, work together like a, cha like, like a team, like a unit. And we're right behind them. And three months on the job. And now my boss... Doesn't want to hear about it. Every day they taunt me and tease me. We'd be in the job trail. There are porn pictures everywhere, all over the whole thing. You know, I can honestly say, in my life, and I'm not getting graphic, but I'm telling you that in my life, I've never, ever, since I've been born again, ever looked lustfully upon a woman once. Since I've been in the kingdom. Do you know how amazing that is to be free? Oh my gosh. This is amazing. And, but every day, man, what's wrong with you? Can't you, you know, you know, the whole joke thing. Like, man, I would cry. Say, I, I am so in love with God. And not one time could they point the finger at me about anything. Not one thing, except for this guy's crazy and he really believes what he's saying. <laughs> and one by one, God healed all of them. Whether they wanted it or not. Because I don't need them to be in agreement with me. I'm the believer. They are not. I don't need you to agree with me for God to heal you because God loves you. Come on. So, like, why do I need you to agree with me? Now you need to believe. Okay, now believe. No, no, you just stand there. Hold still. So, so let me share something with you about like how this thing started out because my, my wife, as amazing as she is, she knew that I was a brand new person. Two weeks into this thing, she told me, I will never go shopping with you again. I will never go to a restaurant. I will never go anywhere in public with you again. Because I read in my body. See, I didn't have a model for this. I didn't have anybody. I, had, uh, I went to a healing service, and I watched Dan. He had a healing service, and I watched people get healed. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm a brand new believer, man. I'm like, yay, I'm free from me. Oh, and then that, see in my Bible that if I believe, things are going to happen. So I just dared to believe that they're going to follow me. If I'm a believer, they're supposed to ha happen. So I saw it happening in the healing service, and I said to Dan, I said, man, this has got to happen outside because Jesus isn't different in here, right? I didn't have anybody to talk me out of it. I'm like a little kid, dude. I read that thing and I'm like, come on. Okay. I'm going after this thing. So I started to pray and I prayed for 9 to 12 people every day. Every day. So my, my wife, my brand new wife, that knows that I'm a brand new man and this part she's not okay with. I'm going out, going to Walmart and see people. Whoa. We'll go over there and pray for them. Turn around, my wife's gone. Well, where did she go? I'm going to come back and find her. Say, honey, what's going on? She goes, will you please stop? Okay. All right. I see someone else. Oh. God, thank you. Boom, boom. Pray. Nothing. Do you know that I prayed for 9 to 12 people every day? And I prayed for a whole week and didn't see anybody get healed. None. Not one. And my wife is freaked out. And she's not seeing any fruit from this thing. All she's seeing is a psycho husband. But there's not one thing that she can point the finger at in my life except for I believe the Bible. And one thing I never did was try to talk her into believing my way. I never said, listen, you need to see this because this is real. You know, never, ever, I would always go back into my room. She, was, she would watch like the whole like reality show stuff, you know. And I was hooked on TV before I went into Teen Challenge. And then when I came out, I couldn't watch it. 
I'm like, because I tried to watch my favorite show, Mad TV, and I started crying. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? God spoke to me. He said, I've given you my heart. You can no longer laugh at other people's expense. <laughs> oh, it was my life, man. Now I can't watch stuff. and not, I, I can watch some things. I just don't, I choose not to put that in because life is short. I'm here to leave a legacy. I'm here to compel and to propel you to be who God created you to be and to be the best you that God created you to be. I'm here to come up under you and to provoke you to show you that, wait a minute, this thing is way more simple than what we've created it to be. You mean that I can just walk in a state of being, be in the mall, and people can get touched everywhere I go? Absolutely. You're the only one that holds God back. See, we teach people that you need to pray for an open heaven, but my Bible says that when Jesus went into the River Jordan, came out, the heavens were open. The only closed heavens between your ears. You don't perish for lack of an open heaven. In the, in the world, what you don't know will hurt you, won't hurt you. But in the kingdom, what you don't know is eating your lunch. And then once you've received it, you can't reject it. You've got to go with it. You have to determine and purpose in your heart to never allow what people don't see to determine and influence the things that you do. You lay hold of something, and your experience might be a fact, and you might be going through some stuff, but never allow your experience to trump and dominate what God says is true. Because God's magnified his word above his own name. Psalms 138 verse 2 says he magnified his word above his name. So anytime, anytime we take a personal experience that didn't line up with what the, what the word of God says and magnified above God's word, we're doing the same thing that Satan did before he was kicked out of heaven. Not that you're going to get kicked out of heaven, but you can't take an experience and say, well, yeah, I know that's what God's word says, but all buts and what ifs that come in that form are devils. Come on. You guys all right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going after this thing. No one's getting healed. One week goes by. Nobody. Now this is like around 70 people. You think, man, how'd you do it? I never allowed my experience to dictate and dominate what God's word says. So two weeks go by, not one person that I saw a manifestation. Three weeks, nothing. Four weeks, nothing. Five weeks, nothing. Two weeks into it, I lost my wife. She didn't say, I'm leaving you, but she said, I'll never go in public with you again. Ever. On my job, I'm praying for people, and they think I'm really whacked. Because nobody's getting healed. Come on, two months into it, not one person. Three months, nobody. You say, how'd you do it? I never allowed my experience to dominate what that word says. You have to, deter you have to purpose this in your heart to settle this. And don't live by a gifting. Don't live by a gifting. Because what will happen is if you roll into a gifting and you've been taught that, you'll pray for people and people, if people don't get healed, you'll think it's not my gift. And you'll sever yourself from being a believer because it says these signs will follow them that believe, not those with the special gift and anointing of healing. So three and a half months go by. My wife is freaked out by me, won't go in public with me. Her whole family that was aggressively against it is now really against it. Big time. Because my wife is talking to her mom, and her mom is like, how are things? Oh, he's crazy. He's crazy. Was he stealing? No, he's working. <laughs> well, is, he, is he swearing at you and, and yelling at you? Not once. So they're, uh, uh, uh. I'd, I'd meet mom. She, you think it's all about Jesus? I said, yes, it is. <laughs> all about him. He's amazing. He loves you so. Don't you tell me about your Jesus. All, I mean, I, I'm talking aggressive. And it was coming from my family. It was coming from my wife. Who was aggressively squeezing me. Persecution is something that is a table that God prepares for you in the midst of it. It's a place to eat. I will prepare a table for you in the midst of your enemies. To where God says, the more it comes, the better a place it is for you to sit down, rest, and eat with the king. And he will be like on a loudspeaker to the devil. He's my son. 
This is how this thing's been formed in me. So you're looking, this is how it started. And so like, I'm just praying, man. I call Dan every day. Man, I, said, I prayed for all these people. Did you see anything? No. What are you going to do? Well, the word says if I believe it's going to happen. So I never entered into that, well, they need to believe. Well, it's not God's time. Well, God's building character. I never even, that's just crazy. I couldn't see it in the model of Jesus. Jesus never said that stuff, so why would I go down that road? I don't need an excuse of why not. I need to rise up and be a son that God called me to be, understand who I really am so the anointing can flow in my life like it flowed in Jesus' life. Because John 14, 12 says that if I'm a believer, greater things are going to flow from my life. But you have to purpose in your heart to never allow your experience to turn you away. It's dead straight. Focus on this thing. Is this making sense? So my guys at my work, and all of a sudden, uh, I see this one guy this one day. I get a word of knowledge about him. and that Never had a word of knowledge. I just went after need. Sometimes we're waiting for a word of knowledge, and we're not going after what we can see. If you see somebody that's hurting, that's a great place to start. Just go after it. Someone has a crutch. Go after it. Someone has a cane, go after it. Someone has a limp, go after it. Someone, you're going through Walmart, man, and, and a lady is, is running the counter. And she says, oh, my back is killing me. <laughs> well, I'm just not feeling led. I tell people, go to a fishing store, buy a bunch of sinkers. They're made of lead. Put it in your pocket. Grab a hold of that thing, feel led, and get this thing on with God. A lot of times we're not feeling led, we're just feeling scared. You don't need a word of knowledge, just love somebody. Just love somebody. Come on. So, so three and a half months into this thing, it's like October, November, December. It's Christmas time. You know, in the midst of all this, uh, I go to my grandmom's house and for Christmas, you know, I'm excited, I'm brand new, you know, and my aunt's there. And I said to her, I said, Holly, I said, hey, I said, this is amazing. Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus this and it's amazing. She goes, shut your face. Don't you tell me about Jesus. And she hammered me with the most amazing intellect. It hurt because she's my fam, you know, she's my peeps. And it hurt my heart. And I, I fell down on my knees and I'm crying and I'm just telling her I love you. And she, Don't you tell me you love me, Todd. All you've done is bang, 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 bang. She's hammering me. And she's intellectually smarter than me. Like most people are. <laughs> but that Bible, it's in me. It's part of my life. It is my life. The Bible is the first book I can read. I had ADHD. I had that learning disability my whole life. The Bible's the first book that I can actually read. Isn't it crazy? It's amazing. I can read other books, but the Bible's the first book that opened up to me. Wisdom of God. Bink! Just started to open it up. I told God, that's it. I don't have any wisdom. I'm wisdomless. <laughs> He's like, way to start. Way to start right there. That's good. Bang! And it opened up. Okay, so I'm talking to my aunt, and she's Beat me up, man. I'm like, man, this hurt. Gosh. Went home, cried in the car. My wife, you know, we're only three months into this thing, so my wife is freaked out by me anyway. You know, I can't really talk to her about my aunt. That hurt really bad. I just tell her I love her. And so I go to my dad's house, and my, my stepmom's there, and I just said, just, this is like only a week later. It's Christmas time at my dad's. I'm like, hey, like, man, Jesus is starting to, Bam! She hammers me worse than my aunt did. And it was like, I mean, I got whooped, you know? Went out of there with my tail between my legs, hurting, you know? Because like, but here's what my prayer was. Now I'm praying for people all the time. I said, God, I don't want to encounter them until you do something to show them that you're real. Because I can't do it with my words. They're smarter than me. And they won't listen to me anyway. And I cried, and I'm crying, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing, because a couple weeks later, that's three and a half months into it, I get that word of knowledge, start to pray. Now I'm starting to see breakthrough, and I'm coming home and sharing with my, my wife. Oh my gosh, you should have seen it on the job. She goes, you're going to get fired. You better be very careful about what you're doing, because I tell her, you know, I'm getting beat up at work, and you're going to get fired. No, no, I won't get fired. This is amazing. This is God. 
God's doing this stuff. My people on my job are getting healed. My my atheist foreman, you know, he gets healed and just having fun. I'm amazing. Yeah, I'm doing a great job. They can't point the finger at me because I'm on my job. I'm doing it amazingly because I'm. You can't be praying for people all the time and let your performance slip. You got to have your performance be above and beyond. Because you, because that's our. View the world gives us a view of their they worship God but they're no good on the job. What if we could be amazing on our job that like the only thing I could point the finger out is that we're supernaturally crazy. I'm serious. God's taking the spirit of ugly off the bride. <laughs> She's becoming pretty again. So anyway. About eight months into our relationship with my wife, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in、uh, a food store. My wife decided that I'm going to go to the store with with my husband, but she won't go near me. She goes to the other side of the store. So my daughter and I are at one side. She's at the other. Now the miracles and stuff is happening in my life, and it's an, and she doesn't want to hear the testimonies. I mean, I remember the time we came home and shared with my wife, and man, we saw someone's leg grow out four inches today at Walmart. And my eight and a half year old daughter was the one that prayed for him. It was awesome. It was, and it was the manager. My wife was like, she was angry because we were gone so long. She goes, I wouldn't have expected anything else. She was angry, and I went back in the bedroom, and I'm like, God, she won't even, she won't even glorify you. I didn't say it to her. I just, you know, my God, help. He said, Aren't you glad it's becoming normal? Because what she said was, I wouldn't have expected anything else. She didn't say, "Don't you tell me." But I didn't hear her because it was a constant thing. Okay. So anyway, we're in the food store, and, and me and my daughter are down the one aisle, and we're walking down, and we see a lady in a scooter, and we're like, "Oh, look, there's a lady in a scooter. Let's go pray." It's like rare meat. We're going, to, you know, we're going to pray. If you see need, you go after it. Jesus said in Matthew 10. He said, "Go and preach the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils." And Luke ten, he said, "Whatever your city go into, heal the sick, and then preach the kingdom." So either way, it's show and tell. You either show it and tell it, or tell it and show it. Either way, it's the same thing. Demonstration gospel. So if you see need, go after it. So we see need, so we're going after it. So I go up, hey, what's going on? Why are you in the? Oh, I had you know back surgery and. I said, "Don't go." I said, "Can my daughter and I pray for you?" She's like, "Honey," she goes, "I pray." I said, "That's awesome." I said, "Well, we're members of the body of Christ. Can we pray too?" She's like, "Listen, I don't need you to pray for me, you know." And her daughter, her granddaughter's there. She's eight and a half, about the same. Well, yeah, about the same age as my daughter. And I looked at the granddaughter, and I said, "Do you want to have your grandma play with you again?" It's a cheap shot. I wasn't thinking that way, honest. But you think about it, you know. The granddaughter goes, "Yeah." Looks at the grandma. Grandma goes, "Oh no, you didn't." <laughs> That's pretty much the look I got. Like I can't believe you just did that. I said, "Look, the worst that can happen is nothing." I, I've learned that from the beginning because if you tell somebody that, it alleviates their expectation. They don't need to expect; you need to. I mean, it helps if they do, but if you have to rely upon them. We need to learn to rely upon us, upon who we are in Him. So I said to her, and and so we prayed for her, and I asked her. I said, "Listen, I said I'd love to have you get out of that scooter so we can see what's going on." So she goes, "You don't realize the kind of pain I've been in." She goes, "My granddaughter has to drive the scooter out to the car to get me out of the car to get me in this store." She goes, "I've had four back surgeries. I'm on chronic pain medication for 29 years. I have to travel down to Baltimore to pay for all these medical." This, this pain medication out of my pocket because I don't have insurance. So she takes everything that she has and she spends it on this. So I'm like, man, let's just can you please just step out of there and let's see where you're at. So she she gets out of the car and she can't move. You know she's locked in this position. I said, come on, let's pray again. So we pray again, and and all of a sudden, Grandma goes like this. And Grandma and and the granddaughter's like, Grandma. And she's tears in her eyes, and you know that she hasn't done this. She's been in this position for 29 years. 
See, when I said to the granddaughter, would you like to have your grandmother pray with, play with you again? Grandma's never played with her to begin with. She looks at her grandma. Her grandma's doing this. I said, what's going on? She goes, I don't know. Something's moving. And she's doing stuff that I couldn't do. And I'm like, get out. That's great. It's awesome. And I'm in tears, you know. And my daughter's like, this is awesome. And the, her granddaughter goes, grandma, run. <laughs> really? So the grandma goes, run. She goes, I can hardly walk. She goes, come on, grandma, let's run. So they run down to the end of the aisle together. And it's awesome. And it's beautiful. And I'm like, oh, God, this is God. This is God. She comes back. And then my wife walks in the aisle. And all of a sudden, my tears dry up. Because my wife is not on page with this. And this is the first time she's come into public with me. It's about to get messed up. So my wife comes in the aisle and she folds her arms. She goes, shakes her head. This lady walks up. And I said, ma'am. I said, how you doing? She goes, this is awesome. I'm healed. I said, can you do me a favor? This is my amazing wife. Her name's Jackie. She's coming in the aisle. Can you go tell her what just happened? And I just backed up. <laughs> Serious. My wife, it's like, the reason why I share this is because it's breakthrough. Because how many of you have relatives that don't believe? We all need this in our life. <laughs> really. So my wife comes in and she's just not on page, man. And this, this lady comes over, talks to my wife. My wife burst into tears. Burst into tears. Now I'm crying again harder than I did. My daughter's like behind me. I said, you can come out now. Des, look. It's mom. Just look at her. Because it was, I mean, it was aggressive. She was angry. Because she didn't have a grid for this. And I did, and I, I determined in my heart, no matter what anybody says, I'm going after this. On my job, it doesn't matter. I'm going after this thing. So I go, I'm going after it. My wife is like silent. We walk out. We go through the register. I don't talk to the lady at the register. We're all crying, except for my daughter. She's got this ear-to-ear -ear smile because she's been praying with me all along. She's been doing this, man. She walks in the kingdom. My five-year-old Zoe walks in this. She's five. She just prays simple stuff like, Ali, go away, Jesus' name, amen. Better? Better? And it gets better. Yeah, it's better. The kids get under the radar. People don't even see it coming. It just, boom, lands on people. So we go home. I go back in the bedroom and just thanking God for the ability to position myself in such a place where I never tried to proclaim what kind of tree I was. See, a cherry tree doesn't stand in the orchard and say, cherries. <clears throat> it just produces cherries because it's a cherry tree. So what kind of tree are you? What if people would come into your life and say, they're a tree of righteousness. Because righteousness bears its fruit unto holiness. The fruit on a righteous tree is holy fruit. So now my wife is out there in the living room and I'm crying. I come out and I say, honey, are you okay? She said, yeah. I said, what's going on? She goes, God spoke to me. I said, what did he say? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> She said, God said that this has always been me. Your husband is a changed man. He's a brand new man. He's the one that I created him to be. And this is me. And she looked at me. She goes, who am I to stand in the way of God? So now my wife is like on page. It's awesome, right? So I'm like two years, two and a half, or uh, that job, I get fired from that job because of the gospel. A couple months later. After my wife is on page, I come home and I get fired. It didn't go over well. I got fired from 30 jobs, you know. Quitter got fired from all. And she's like, it's happening again? I said, honey, God, God will open a door. And within a couple of days, I'm at another job, higher pay. 
You know, and God just does that. Don't be afraid to share the gospel on your job and bring it. But bring it in love. Don't bring it in... Just be careful. It's all in your approach. It's our motivation can't be go out there and win souls. Our motivation has to be the love of God to where we shine as light in the world. You know God is the father of lights and you are those lights? So I go and I'm doing a conference. We're doing a power and... Can I talk about that a little? Power and love. We're doing a power and love conference here in October. It's October 12th to 15th. It's a conference that equips, and what we do is we do outreaches during the whole thing, where we do teaching, outreach, teaching, outreach, teaching, outreach, teaching, outreach, and they actually change lives. Just because you're hearing and doing it, and it, it's just awesome. So if you, if you ever want to be a part, it's powerandlove.org. We're going to be here in Texas in October, October 12th through 15th. But I'm, we're doing our, like one of our first ones, and it's in Ohio, and... I'm going there and I, I'm like at the conference and I'm speaking. I'm starting to see just God's doing amazing things and starting to lead people by example into, into encounters. And my cell phone keeps getting this call on it and it's like constant. And it won't stop. I don't know who it is and they're not leaving a message. So then they, my mom calls me and says, your Aunt Holly is trying to get a hold of you. She lives in the town that you're doing the conference in. That's the one that beat me up really bad. That hammered me. That I couldn't talk to her. That I told God, don't let me encounter her. Until you're going to do something to show her that you're amazingly real. So my aunt's calling. So I'm like, hey. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, Todd, I hear you're speaking in my hometown. I'm like, I didn't know this was your hometown. Mom just said it was. She goes, yeah, I want to come and hear you speak. I'm thinking, oh gosh. Serious. It's my fam, man. It's my peeps, right? So she said, listen, she goes, when are you speaking next? And I said, well, I'm going to speak in about, you know, about 45 minutes. She goes, I'm meeting a friend of mine for lunch. She goes, I can't come today, but I want to come tomorrow. I'm like, okay. She goes, yeah, we're meeting at the Tumbleweed restaurant. I looked out my hotel room, and the Tumbleweed is right beside my hotel. I said, you're going there right now? She goes, yes, I am. And God spoke to me and gave me a word of knowledge about her friend. Said she has scoliosis, one of her legs is way shorter than the other, and she's all messed up in her back. I said, your friend has a really messed up back, right? She goes, yeah. I said, oh my gosh, I'll be right there. <laughs> See, God is a better convincer than you are. So I go in, we pull into the parking lot. This is real, is this making any sense? I want to provoke you, because this is yours, man. It's not just mine. I am here to like come up under you and equip you for the works of the ministry. Not just full time. We've not realized that our job is our mission field. That everywhere you go, you are called, man, to do this thing, to bring the kingdom. Not by a, just a gifting, but by a believer priesthood that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and wants to touch the world. And the same mission. See, your mission is not to go to heaven. Your mission is to destroy hell. Your destination is to get to heaven. But God's first destination is to get heaven into you, to repossess that which was lost so you can destroy hell every day. And 1 John 3, 8 becomes your mission. To destroy the works of the devil. Everywhere you go. Death, loss, destruction? Mm-mm. Nope. Bang. That's what we do. So my aunt is like over there. I go over to the parking lot and pull in and Dan and I are there and I go, and God says, that's the car that her friend's in. So I run over to the car. She didn't get out of her car yet. I go, hey, I said, are you meeting Holly here? She goes, yes. She's freaked out. I said, man, you have a bad back, right? She goes, yeah. I said, God's going to heal you. I'll be back. And I ran into the restaurant. She's like, and Dan's there. He's like, <laughs> I go in. I said, Holly, this is awesome. God told me who your friend was when I pulled in the parking lot. She goes, what? I said, come on. This is going to be awesome. Come out here. Let's go. Come on. So she comes outside. She says, what are you doing? I said, just sit here. Sat her friend down. Her friend's legs like a couple inches short. So we pray. Her leg grows out. My aunt watches it. She's like freaked out. Her friend's in the chair. Like, what is going on right now? She has no idea. She's just the collateral. The bomb went off. She's collateral blessed. It's collateral blessing. <laughs> so a lady comes up in a wheelchair. She's wheeling up in front. And, and she's coming right down the sidewalk. And I said to her, I said, ma'am. I said, what's going on with you? She goes, I'm, I'm paralyzed from the waist down. I said, 
I said, what happened? She said, about seven years ago, whatever. And I said, can we, can my friend and I pray for you? Now, Holly is sitting there, very intellectual, trying to wrap her head around what just happened with her friend's leg and her back, because her back popped straight, which is really cool. So that's always cool, right? Come on. Scoliosis says, see you later. Can't hang out anymore. So I said to her, I said, I said, we're going to pray for you. And my aunt is right here. She can't move. It's like where pastor is and the lady's right here and we're praying for her. I said, can we pray for her? She goes, well, if you want to. So start praying. And she goes like this, starts going like this in the chair. She's not a Christian. So she doesn't know that that's what we do. <laughs> she, I mean, she's, you know what I mean? She doesn't have any idea. That's what my point is. And my, my aunt Holly, she's like, what's going on? I go, I don't know. So all of a sudden, then her legs start to do this. Her paralyzed legs. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, I need you to try to get out of that chair. She lifts herself up, shaking. She's got feeling going into her legs. And my aunt goes, I've got to go. So she gets up and goes into the restaurant. And, and I'm, I'm like going to be late for my meeting. So I just talk to this lady and share with her about the love of God and what God's doing in her legs. And, you know, and, and she's, she's a Christian now. So it was awesome. And her friend was like, this is God. This is God. So she goes in. She parks her wheelchair right across the table from my aunt. So I go and do the meeting. And I get a phone call from my aunt. And she's like, Todd, she goes, I want to come in here and speak tonight. So she comes and hears me. And she cries the whole time. Just cries the whole time. And she's just totally wrecked. And prayed for her. Prayed for her, uh, her back and her knee. And God healed her. And this is the one that beat me up. And God's just loving her. It's awesome. And so she goes back to the, to the she asked me before she goes, she goes, Todd, and this was the afternoon, that wasn't the night. Yeah, because she came, she came and the, no, it was. She said, I, I, can, God, can God heal an animal? I said, well, sure. Does the animal matter? She goes, yeah, well, my horse tore a muscle in its hind end. And, and and I can't show my horse for six months, or five and a half months, until the horse heals. I said, well, okay. So we prayed for her horse. So she goes back. She gives me a call. She, God healed her horse's butt. <laughs> so she's really excited. God healed, God healed her horse's butt to get to my aunt's heart. <laughs> That's crazy. It matters to her. Crazy, right? So she comes to the meeting and, and she goes back. She gives me a call back and she goes, Todd, she goes, I need you to come down here to the horse club. I said, what's going on? She goes, I told everybody here that if you come down here, everybody will be healed. So my skeptical aunt takes it back to the horse club. And I come down, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got, a, I got a meeting. She goes, I am on my way already to pick you up. So you're not getting out of this. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and I go down there and I go in, there's a circle of chairs, all these people inside the horse stables, like in the open area. And they're all looking at me like this. My aunt, I come in, my aunt goes, here he is. <laughs> Tell him, Todd. She's so happy, it's her new nephew. So God healed everyone. That's awesome. That's great, right? So I go up and I meet with my, meet with my dad, meet with his wife, and, and I, I'm talking to her, and she hammers me. I talk to her about Jesus, and I said to her, I said, I said, Cheryl, I said, I need to pray for your back. And my dad looks at me like, oh, man, I can't believe you did that. My aunt goes, are we really going to do this again? I said, well, I say we just pray and see what's really real. If it's not, then nothing will happen. She goes, fine. She's swearing, you know, turns around. She goes, what do you got to do? I said, I'm just going to pray for you. She turns around and put my hand on her back and said, God, show her how real you are, how much you love her. She bent down, and by the time she came up, she's in tears. She turns around. She's angry. She's not a believer. She's crying. She's in tears. She goes, I'm sorry. I said, it's okay. I was never mad at you. I love you. She's a Christian. My aunt's a Christian. You know, my stepdad that came to my wedding and said, I hate you, you're a loser, all that. You know, I did a meeting at my home church just a couple months ago, two months ago. He came. He's the first one up. 
I need Jesus in my life. Why? Because I walked this thing out. See, a couple months ago, he's in the hospital. He's angry. He's bitter. Angry. He has like this, he has a blood clot in his leg, so they filleted his leg to get to this blood clot. Well, he has one in his heart, right outside of his heart, ready to, problem, aneurysm, right there. Doctors are like, you know, we're going to have to do open heart, this and that, and get this thing done. And I go in the hospital, he's laid in the bed, and he can't move. I said to him, I said, dude, I said, you know, i got to pray for you, right? He's like, yeah, I figured you'd want to. I said, well, right. So I put my hand on him and prayed. God, thank you that you love him so much in Jesus' name. He went and had a scan done and God took that thing out. He's angry and not a believer and it doesn't matter. God loves him profusely. So now he's a Christian. Her mom, she gets baptized. She's a Christian. My mom's a Christian. My dad's a Christian. My whole family, there's only a couple left and they ain't getting out of this. This is the life that we're called to lead. See, I, I love to talk about testimonies, but I want to make it personal. I want to make it personal in your life. I have thousands of these same kinds of things. I want to make it personal so that it reproduces itself in your life, in your family, in your workplace where everybody's against you. Because all them guys, they were all healed on my job. Even the ones that didn't believe and angry, they're Christians. Why? Because we're light. Because darkness isn't the issue. It's never who turned up the darkness. It's who turned down the light. We're not called. If you're the only one at work that knows you're a Christian, something's twisted. You can say all you want. You can use your job as an excuse. Of, well, if I do, then I'll lose my job. Man, there are no excuses. You're not going to stand before God. Stand before Him. So I couldn't share the gospel because... just not going to go over. That ought to convict our hearts. One day we're going to stand before the king and he's going to say, what have you done or well done? And that's not mean. That's real. That's real. And you're not a goat. You're a sheep. See, not everybody applauds that one. But it's real. We ought to raise our kids with the very understanding that one day we're going to stand before the king and he's going to say, well done or what have you done? Come on, and you don't have to pray for people. You get to. You don't have to like bring this thing. You don't have to go to the mall. And, and but look, the other day we go to the mall and just saw a lady with a cane. And I was walking with a, a buddy, Alan and, and Robert, my friend. And we're just walking through and see a lady with a cane. I asked her, I said, what happened? She needs two new, new knees, knee replacements. And I asked her if I could pray for her. And her daughter like she walks around the other side like crazy guy. Does it matter? God loves her too. So I want to pray for her mom. So we prayed and, and she tries to walk and she's in pain. We pray and what'd you do? What'd you do? Just prayed in Jesus' name. So she's like, touch, there's a kid sitting on the seat and we got him boxed in. He's just standing, just sitting there like, kind of like praying. Good kid, man. Just trapped, can't get away. I said, you're trapped, man. We're praying, you know, and she gets healed. She's like, it's gone. It's really gone. She goes, pray for my mama. She's got a problem in her neck. So we prayed for her mama. She goes, Ugh. It's hurting. So we prayed again. Hit it again and again. She goes, it's gone. Jesus loves you so much. You're amazing. So we walk, we walk away. You know, from that, we just talked to him. Planted seed. You're a seed sower or water. You're not the one that brings the increase. So the pressure's off. That's a good word. Some sow, some water. It's God that brings increase. So you're not there to harvest that thing. You're just there to sow. But the word of God says that when a seed is sown, it grows up. When the seed is sown, it grows up. It's, mark, it's, it's awesome. It's like the law. It's the kingdom. It's all seed. So we plant. We water. God brings increase. See, a lot of times we don't see the increase, so we don't think that anything's working. I've got news for you. Holy Spirit is a better evangelist than you are. And we've got to believe that he's a big boy. And you don't always have to seal the deal. 
You're just part of the equation. So when you approach somebody and tell them, look, I just want to tell you that God thinks you're amazing. He loves you so much. And you encourage somebody or edify somebody. It's just as powerful as saying, stand to your feet and walk. Sometimes we think it's less powerful, but it's equally as important. It's all seed. You're amazing. And don't don't discount anything because just the fact of edification and encouragement. You're a steward of grace. Do you understand that? That the words that you speak, you steward grace. God said that let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but only that which is used for edification and encouragement. That provides grace for another. You have favor with God. You have grace that's on your life. And you have been given the stewardship of the favor. And God will cause increase on the life of the person that you encourage. And allow you to write the check in Jesus name. For encouragement and favor and grace on a person's life. And God knows who to write the check to by the words that you speak. That's a big, see words are way more powerful than you think. What would, what makes you, what, what's hard about telling somebody, hey, I just want to tell you that God loves you and you're amazing. You are amazing. 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 I see a leader in you. I see somebody that like, that, that doesn't, that, 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 that what I'm saying to you is the real deal, man. But God is doing something inside of your heart. And there is just an amazing young man, an amazing leader that's inside of you. And God is bringing grace upon your life to change the reality. Because there's this black sheep, there's this thing where you're like, I can't do anything right, I can't do anything right. Everything I try, bang. Everything I try to do, bang. Everything I try to do. But this year is going to be an amazing year of grace on your life, man. Because but in this thing where you just, I don't know what direction. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what direction. I see web design. I see computers on your life. I see just the amazing high-tech industry. Just this web, you're a creator. I see like, I see... Uh, Oh my gosh. Art, like web design, computer, just the web designing, just the computer graphics, like animated graphics where you're going to actually have this, have this thing. It's going to come out of computers. This is God, man. I can feel it all over me. I know it is. You're not getting out of it. No one's told me anything about you. They didn't set you up for this. This is God. You've just said, man, where's my niche? Where's my niche? And you're like, Christianity, whatever. This is you, man. You're going to bring the kingdom into the computer systems. You're going to have actually a web, a web designing thing where you're going to design different websites and work on different people's websites. And it's going to go internationally. And it's going to be not just in America. It's going to be internationally. I see the UK being a big part of what you're going to do. I actually see uh, 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 China. Just, just, it's going to be crazy because you're going to be traveling. You're not going to just be here. You're going to be here. You're going to have something based here, but you're going to be traveling. You're going to start to oversee different companies, but they're all going to be underneath of a head company that's going to come through you because there's an entrepreneurial kind of thing inside of you. I love you, man. Jesus. This is more simple than you think. You can do it. All of you can. Everyone, just open your mouth. Just step forward. Just step out. Step out. Dare to step out. Create a place for Holy Spirit to land on. We're so used to being comfortable. We're so used to just staying inside our comfort zone. Holy Spirit has called the comforter because he knew that you were going to be uncomfortable to step into this thing. All you've got to do is allow him a place to land on your life. That's it. Just let him land and you can speak. And the words that you speak become both spirit and life because God's on it. And creates life in that very one that had none. And all of a sudden, what? Doesn't matter what people think. God's bigger than all that stuff. Man, I went to a class the other day. I'll share that testimony and we'll pray. All right? About the, I went to a, there's a school in my area and they, you guys are awesome. I went to a school the other day and this school... 
four years ago, had, they tried to bring in intelligent design. They tried to bring in this intelligent design um, to where they can teach evolution, but they tried to bring Christianity into it. It's Dover High School. It was on CNN News about four years ago. If you, know, if you remember, a big debate thing. and didn't. Well, it didn't pass. And so, like, that was the last time school was on the news. Well, that school happens to be about seven miles from my house. So they, a lady from my church, uh, uh, she knows some people that, that go to that school and knows a teacher there who has a religious debate class. It's an elective. They bring in every different religion, you know, and every different one, and then the kids debate with them. So they're like, uh, we, you know, we're going to bring, Todd, would you be willing to come in? So I'm like, okay, I'll come in, because I'm so done with debate. But I'm going to, debate, to a debate class. Which doesn't make sense. So the day before I went, they asked me to come on Wednesday. And I said I couldn't. I could come on Thursday because I was just traveling. And so Thursday comes and I went there. And the day before, there were two Mormon elders that went there and got drilled. You know, they come in in a suit and tie and all that stuff. And they come in to explain. And the kids are debating. And they're trained to debate. They're trained to. And so I'm not trained to debate. And like the debate that I just... Uh, they're smarter than me, so I just don't, I don't go in there. <clears throat> Serious. So I go into the class, and Mr. Hoover's like, this is Todd White. I come into the class, and the kids are like, what? <laughs> and some of them are thinking, this is going to be easy. <laughs> it is. So I go in, and Mr. Hoover goes, this is Todd White, and he speaks on Christianity, so he's going to be here to debate and talk about Christianity. So I'll open it up for questions. The kids are like, Whoa. they're going to hammer me for my hair, you know, whatever. They're just going to bring it, you know. And so the one girl raises her hand, and I see her, and I said to her, I said, ma'am, and she goes, and she starts to speak, and I said, hold on a second. I said, you've got asthma. <laughs> she goes... Yeah, and I said, and also I said, you want to be, uh, you want to be a nurse. You want to be a pediatric nurse. You're going, you're headed to college to be a pediatric nurse. I think that's great because you've worked with children your whole life. And I said, it's really amazing because you've a real compassionate heart. God's given you this thing. Not everybody has that same grace on their life. There's a real grace for children to raise up children. She's like, who are you? <laughs> so well, my name's Todd White. I'm a Christian. So another kid raised his hand, and I said, hey, I said, you, I said, you play football. He's like, yeah. I said, you got a problem with your right shoulder? Yeah, come here. So all the kids, no one's asking questions now. <laughs> really, serious. Kid comes up. I said, what are you scared of, man? This ain't going to hurt you. I said, just come here. So I put my hand on his shoulder. Shoulder be healed in Jesus' name. I said, what's going on? He goes, it's hot. I said, well, move it around. He goes, what? I said, God loves you so much. And I started to share about who he is and what I saw in his life. I started to prophesy about the reality of what God sees over his life. He's like, that's what I want to do. I said, isn't that awesome? He's like, yeah. Another kid. What about me? <laughs> See, this changes everything. We need to give the world something that's unexplainable. See, in John 10, 25, John 10, 37, 38, around in there, it says, if you don't believe me through the words that I say, at least believe me through the works that I do, for it's the Father who dwells in me who does the works. So that's always made sense to me. Like, I can't debate you and talk you into it enough. At least you'll have to believe, for it's the Father in me who does the works. So now, God has put me into a position to where I get to go places and get to take people into the public arena, get to take people into marketplace or wherever, and demonstrate the kingdom. And if they don't believe me through what I say, at least believe me through what I do, for it's the Father that dwells in me who does the works. And we need to be that kind of Christian that would say, listen, I'm not going to know the answers to the debate. Because debate doesn't fix anything. Debate draws people and draws them away. Look, I, this is crazy because I'm in this class and I'm praying for these kids and there's, there's a teacher and there's a guy sitting behind. He's just an observer. He's just sitting back there. And he goes to walk out 
And I said, sir, I said, before you leave, I said, there's a real problem in your back. I said, something's going on. I said, well, I don't know what, what, what it is. It's discs. He goes, yes, I have two bad discs in my back. I said, man, can you sit down here? And I have a chair in the front now. And, uh, I, and I sit him down and prayed for him, and his leg grows out. And the kids are like, what? So I had them all come up and watch. I need you guys to all, did you ever see a short leg? I say to people, what? Come here. And they all look, oh, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. And whoo, his leg comes out. They go, What? And I said to the guy, I said, man, I said, I, I said, I don't know who you are. I said, but I know this. I said, you've got kidneys that give you trouble. Constant. He goes, I get kidney stones, chronic. And the kids are like, oh, my gosh. None of them knew that. He's the vice principal of the school who's a Christian who wanted to hear my view on Christianity. God spoke to him and told him to come to the class to listen to me speak. He doesn't know who I am. And the kids, are, and he stands up and I said, there's a governmental thing upon your life. I said, you're going to actually speak into government. And I said, it's something that's upon you. And I started to prophesy. And she goes, well, right now I'm a vice principal and this is what I, where I need to be. And I said, I understand that. And you're a very good one. And the kids were like, what is going on? This is crazy. So now class is like getting over. I had another girl up and prayed for her and her scoliosis gets straightened out. She's like freaked out, crying. In the chair, sitting there, crying, shaking. Because kids were coming up to the chair. And one by one, they'd get in the chair and they'd... And it wasn't fear. So she's like, they're like... Some of them are crying. Other students are like, are you okay? Yes. Why are you crying? I don't know. God's hanging out. What if we realize the dominion of God upon our life and realize that every place you step foot in, God's given to you because you're an ambassador? So that first class lets out, and they're like not wanting to leave. The bell rings, and none of them's, you know, when bells ring, people are out. They're ready to go. And they're like, the bell rings, and they're all sitting there. And then some of them are standing and walking real slow, like, call on me. I'm serious. People want a word. They want to know. They want to know what God thinks. Second class is coming in. There's students that are telling us I can hear them. They go, oh, you guys are in for it, man. <laughs> what are you talking about? And they come in and they, what? Sit down and some of them are sharing with their friends. So their friends are like sitting down very curious because they're telling them, man, this guy told us everything about us. It's crazy, man. Never been anything like, never seen anything like you guys are in for it. So they're sitting down, kind of like, no pressure. <laughs> right? So the second class, same thing starts. Start sharing my testimony, start to pray, start to prophesy over people and kids are getting healed. It's crazy. The whole session, not one question. Not one. Both classes, both debate classes, not one question. <laughs> Unheard of. The teacher's like calling on people. Now you always have questions. And, and no, I'm good. Do you know that when you walk in this, that you're a conviction to the world? You don't have to point out their stuff. Do you know that when the light is in the place, all darkness is made manifest? And you don't have to point it out for them to feel like, oh man, someone's, ooh, jeez. Because you're there. But if you don't like expose their darkness, if you just bring the love of God, it's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. It's scriptural. It's, the good, it's his goodness that illuminates the very fact that they're in darkness. See, I call Christians a bug light. Because it's bright and beautiful and it's blue. And it lights up the place and bugs are like, what is it? <laughs> and when they get close enough, me what about the presence of God in your life what about allowing his presence to evangelize the people that are around you what about taking the hand of somebody and just like I was talking a little bit about the new age people just encountering new age people that I don't have to like you don't try to tell them that your way's right and their way's wrong they see already most of them say that you've got a blue glow and you're around you that's what I hear I was doing a session in Kauai, and this new age guy comes to the, to the 
church. They don't come to church, but he's there. First night I share, and he's sitting on his chair, like, with his legs folded like crazy yoga. Just crazy. Like, he's just sitting there. And I'm sharing, and I watched his legs unfold, and I watched him lean on the edge of his seat for two hours. Just look at me. I didn't say anything to him. Second day, comes back. Third day, he's in the thing. And I walked over to him, and I said what God was sharing with me, and I started to share about who he was. He looks at me, and he starts going. He starts to shake in tears. I said, stand up, man. Stands up. I said, Holy Spirit's coming right now. And he goes, okay. Wham! Holy Spirit hit him, and he's like, ah! I'm serious, crazy. And I hugged him and held him. Just told him how amazing he was. How awesome God thinks about him. And he's, I need this Jesus. And he gets wrapped. He's a, he's a, he's a new age psychic hypnotist healer. <laughs> whose neck has been hurting for nine years. And it's not anymore. And he got delivered by the love of God. And now he's an on fire Christian that's going to bring it into a new age community. I've encountered him hiking on a mountain. I'm at the top of this like peak called, it's on Kauai, it's called the, the Sleeping Giant. Go to the top and I meet this lady. She's on there. She's with her son. And I looked and she's doing all this different stuff. I said to her, I said, hey, I said, how you doing? She goes, I'm okay. I said, I said, you've got something going on right now with your neck. She goes, oh, yeah, I do. And I said, can I pray for you? She goes, oh, what do we do? I said, Just let me see your hands. So I prayed for her. Jesus' name, neck be healed. She goes, wow, it's gone. I said, God loves you so much. And her son's there. And I said to him, I said, hey. And he growls at me and walks away. He's like seven. And I said to him, I said, man, I said, what's your name? And he tells me his name. And she goes, that's not his real name. His real name's Caleb. And I said, hey, I said, come here, man. He goes, no. He goes, I have 12 deities. And I said, awesome. I said, can I tell you what the name Caleb means? And I told him. He got closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And he stood in front of me. I said, can I pray for you? He goes, okay. Prayed for him. His name's Caleb. I see him when I go there. And he's like excited. He's changed. This lady wants me to do New Age meetings on the North Shore. Why? Because Jesus is the real light. Come on, I've encountered these people. What are we doing? We encounter them. I prayed for a lady and she's in a pizza shop and I'm talking. It's in Sedona. Did you ever hear of Sedona? Great place to hang out. So she's there and I asked the guy, I said, can I pray for this lady? He's like, well, I mean, what, why? I said, because she's got a problem with her back and it's really bad. And he asked her and she says, yeah, well, she's, she's a Wiccan. So what? God loves her. I said, like, and I got her hand and I prayed for her. And she, she's got this fear look in her eyes. I said, what's going on? What do you see? She goes, she goes, she tells this guy in another language. She said, when he prayed for me, I saw a cross with a man that had a smile. Who is this man and what is this cross? This is the reality that we live in. This is who we are. This is who we are. Okay, i got to stop. What time is it? It's not good. It's 3 o'clock, isn't it? It's not good. No, I just, I just, I want to pray something corporately over everybody. I want to pray, because this thing is impartable, and I believe it's impartable through the message. Honestly. But I want to pray a prayer. and Just pray this to be upon your life. And I want to... I want to I want to establish relationship. I already talked to Pastor Steve and his wife, and I just I love you guys, and I want to establish relationship. I I want to just whatever I can do to help to come up under, to help get you out of the boat. Like you can't preach the whole gospel in one session. I tried this morning, it didn't work. No, but I want to share life experiences, and I want to share with you that this thing is yours. Don't allow what other people don't see to influence the things that you do see. Okay. So let me pray something. Just put your hand on your head. 
Father, I thank you in Jesus' name, God, for grace upon the lives of people here. I thank you, Father, that this would be their life. God, thank you for amazing grace, God, that they would walk in this, that they would flow in this, that you would impart to people here through the message. God, through the message that we would determine in our heart to not allow what people don't see to influence the things that we do see. That, God, you would raise up a generation that would walk in such an amazing power of God that flows through the love of God that it wouldn't matter what people think or what they say, that we would flow in such a way where we would flow from the love of God towards everyone. God, I thank you for that grace upon the lives of people, that you would bless them, that you would increase favor upon everyone in here. Father, I thank you for favor upon businesses, God, favor upon schools, favor upon just favor upon people, God, in every position, in every walk of life. That, God, you would raise them in such a way to where it would be all kingdom. Where the workplaces would be invaded by a new breed of Christian. One that is so supernaturally heavenly minded that they're earthly supernaturally amazing. God, that we would have our head, our mind set on things above and not things beneath. That, God, we would realize that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Father, I thank you for grace upon the lives of everyone in here, God. That my life would be imparted through this prayer upon people. Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.